Hey everyone, this is Jim Kurtz with Harvest Harmonics, and I want to thank you once again for joining us here at Innovation in Agriculture, uh, the weekly show where we bring different innovations in farming and agriculture so that you can uh, be more aware of how to make your operation more efficient, how you can make your operation more profitable, how you can keep up with uh, emerging trends in agriculture so that your farm stays ahead of the curve. Now, interesting thing enough is, of course, today's show we're going to be talking about how to make your plants and how to make your farm more efficient at utilizing fertilizer. Now, if you, unless you've been living under a rock lately, uh, the last three or four months, we've obviously seen huge, huge uh, increases in, in the cost of fertilizer. And now with the whole uh, situation with Russia and Ukraine, uh, we're obviously seeing a lot of shortages also. In fact, there's, there's, they're predicting possible food shortages as a result, because let's face it, if you don't have enough fertilizer, you can't grow enough crops, can't grow enough crops, you don't have enough food, and then we all know what happens there. Now, this doesn't have to be uh, the, the fate of mankind, right? But we can actually do something about this. And we need to act fast, though, because this season is already underway in a lot of areas. And as, a, as of this recording, it's, it's April in 2022. People are getting plant, they're starting their planting, they're starting their season. And if we wait too long, these fertilizer shortages are actually going to dramatically reduce productivity. Now, this is going to be a huge issue in Europe and in the Middle East and in Africa and other areas that are direct importers of fertilizers and other things from Russia. As you all know, there's sanctions and various things that are going to be preventing a lot of that stuff. Uh, so they're going to be looking for their fertilizer elsewhere. What does that mean? That means that other areas like the United States and other areas are going to be hit too with fertilizer shortages. I've already been reading several articles this week where farmers are basically saying they already locked in the price of their fertilizers last year, like a whole year ago, because they had heard that there's going to be dramatic increases in fertilizer pricing. So they locked in their pricing a whole year ago, you know, being proactive again. Unfortunately, now uh, the, the manufacturers are saying well, they can't deliver the product that they already had reserved. So because of these shortages, so there's a lot of different issues going on with agriculture right now. And I want to show you what you can do to be proactive and be more efficient at the utilization of fertilizer without reducing your productivity and your yield, because that's the important part. Um, you don't want to uh, just reduce your yield just because of the cost of fertilizer or lack of fertilizer, right? Um, with our system, the system I'm going to show you in a little bit here, I'm going to show you how you can actually dramatically reduce your fertilizer usage and your dependence upon petrochemical fertilizers, and you can also make your plants more efficient and healthier. So stay tuned for that. So, But before we really get into that, I'm going to share something with you. And this is something uh, I was looking on the internet today and I saw this. This is actually a, a, a website called The World in Data or Our World in Data. Uh, they have a lot of useful information and demographics and various things. And uh, I, I do refer to this website quite often when I'm looking for information because, again, I always strive to uh, communicate truthful and factual information for you. And I don't want to just wing it or come up with something or whatever. I want to actually reference actual data and actual uh, real world information. So this, the world in data is a very good website. I found. Now, this particular slide you're looking at here is nitrogen use efficiency. Now, obviously, we know that nitrogen is one of the big three fertilizers, big three elements used in all fertilizers. You know, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, or NPK, those are the three main nutrients that uh, most fertilizers focus on. We obviously have other micronutrients and other macronutrients like calcium, magnesium, um, zinc, manganese, iron and all these other things, those are all very important also. But when you're talking about fertilizer, you're generally talking about nitrogen. <clears throat> and then subsequently potassium or potash and, uh, and phosphorus also. But taking a look at nitrogen use, this is actually a, um, a, a very interesting graph and, and I just have it in picture form here. Um, I don't have the actual, um, I don't have the actual slide, but it, this actually has graphs and actually uh, when you go to this website where this uh, where this graph is, you can actually click on each country and see what the fertilizer usage efficiency is for each country over time. And you can actually, they went all the way back to 1961 and all the way up to 2014. So I've kind of freeze framed it here at 2014 so you can kind of see in different regions of the world how efficient they are at utilizing fertilizer, specifically nitrogen-based fertilizer. And by the way, guys, if you have questions, please, um, of course, feel free to ask them in the comments here. Ask them in uh, on the Facebook or YouTube comments. Uh, I will be checking those out. I will be definitely answering those questions for you. So if you have questions as we go through here, please feel free to ask them. I'll, I'll be happy to answer for you. But just looking at this, the interesting thing is um, it actually breaks down uh, by color the efficiency of nitrogen use. And, and how they measure this is when they measure 
nitrogen in the crops or nitrogen in the plants that are used in farming. And they compare that to the amount of nitrogen that's used in the fertilizers for that crop. So they actually ask farmers, hey, how much, how many tons of, uh, how much tons of nitrogen did you use or anhydrous ammonia or, or various nitrogen compounds did you use in fertilizer for your farm, right? And they say, okay, we, we use X number of tons per acre. And we have this many acres. They say, okay, good. Now what they're going to do is measure the nitrogen in the plants uh, at the end of the season. And they actually can tell how much uh, nitrogen those plants absorb versus how much was originally used to fertilize the crops, right? And they they express that in percentage. Now the idea is the higher the percentage, the better off the farm is. In other words, the more of that natural fer the fertilizer that's being applied is actually being used by the plants. And that's a good thing because we don't want to be pumping a lot of extra nitrogen in the soil and then not having it being used. That creates a number of problems. First of all, as we all know from an economic standpoint, if you're only uh, if the plants are only absorbing 30 or 40 percent of the nitrogen that you're using, that means that 60, you know, 70, 60 or 70 percent of the night of the money you're spending on nitrogen is just being wasted, right? You're not actually going to crop production, and that's a huge problem, obviously, right? Especially now that the cost of nitrogen has skyrocketed. I mean, I, I'm hearing. In some areas, that nitrogen's cost, uh, you know, anhydrous ammonia and other nitrogen compounds are well over a thousand dollars a ton, whereas it used to be two hundred dollars a ton or three hundred a ton. So, um, if you're looking at you're you're having to pay a thousand dollars a ton and you're having to use three, four, or five tons per acre, you got a hundred acres. Obviously, that's a lot of money to be putting into fertilizer. And if those crops are not actually utilizing a, a good percentage of that, that means most of your money is being wasted. The second key area that that's really that, that this becomes a real problem is in, in terms of its environmental. Now, a lot of people don't understand, but nitrogen compounds or nitrous oxide and other nitrogen compounds uh, account for uh, greenhouse gases that are 200 to 300 times more powerful uh, in terms of greenhouse uh, gases than carbon dioxide. And that means that uh, one molecule of nitrous oxide, for example, uh, creates 200% uh, or 200 times more global warming effects than carbon dioxide would. So um, huge, huge problems. And then the other problems besides the, the environmental, the atmospheric effect of these nitrogen compounds is nitrogen leaches out into the soil and it goes into the waterways. And this can actually really upset the balance in nature of, uh, of fish and other wildlife in the waterways and can create things like algae blooms and red tides and other things like that. It can cause a lot of environmental damage when a lot of this excess nitrogen is just flowing out of the farm and into uh, But um, I wanted to just to kind of reference this. If we look here on the screen, um, you know, countries like the United States here, uh, you know, other areas, uh, I believe that's, uh, I can't remember if that's Bolivia, I'm not sure uh, where here is, but you know, certain countries like a couple of countries here in Africa are in the blue. That means that 80 to 90 percent of the nitrogen being used in fertilizer is being absorbed by the plants. Uh, in Indonesia as well, uh, in other areas here, uh, you know, a lot of the areas, most of the areas you see the, what we call the industrialized world, like the United States, you know, in, in, in certain countries in Europe here and certain countries in Africa and Australia, you know, they're at the 60 to 80 percent range. And then you have countries like Brazil and Canada and Mexico, they're in the uh, 40 to 60 percent range. Now, the real interesting thing when I was looking at this that, that may not quite lead about, leap out at you, but it's very, very important to understand. Look at these countries that are in the light green here. These are the 20 to 40 percentile range. And this is countries like China, like India, like Pakistan, like Japan, uh, you know, in, in, in Scandinavia, the North African countries. Uh, of Peru and some of these countries, Peru, Chile, and some of these countries in um, in uh, you know in South America here, and I think uh, we have a lot of uh, thankfully right now we have a lot of farms in South America like Peru, Chile, and these other countries that have a lot of installations of our Kimenasi plant booster. <coughs> so these figures came from 2014, and I'm sure now that these countries are are really adopting our technology that these numbers will shift, but. When you look at countries like India and China, what does that really mean? That means there's a lot of people in those countries, right? Probably a third of the world's population, maybe even, maybe even, um, you know, more like almost half of the world's population comes from India and China. Now, there's like probably three or four billion people in these two or three countries right here. 
And these countries uh, are, are one of the worst in terms of nitrogen efficiency. So basically, uh, only 20 to 40 percent of the nitrogen that these countries are used to produce the food for all of these people is actually going into crop production. All the rest is being leached out and wasted and going into the environment. That means a ton of petrochemical use is being done in these countries, and it's creating a huge environmental effect. Um, and, and again, farmers in these countries are not necessarily rich farmers necessarily, but they're, they're actually creating a lot of environmental damage. They're wasting so much money, they're trying so hard to get into uh, India and China and these other countries. But basically that means that you know, anywhere between you know, 60 and 80% of all the nitrogen that these countries are using is being wasted, it's just completely wasted, right? Um, and then even in countries like, you know, Brazil and Canada and Mexico, where you have a 40 to 60 percent increase, that means that anywhere between 40 and 60 percent of the nitrogen used in these countries, which are fairly industrialized, is being used for crops. All the rest of it's being wasted. So 40 to 60 percent of, of the nitrogen there is being wasted. You know, other countries all throughout Africa, you see anywhere between 20 percent, a lot of these, you know, 40 to 60 percent. So 20 to 60 percent throughout most of Africa is actually being wasted. They're, they're wasting more than half of the fertilizer that they're using in these developing countries. And that's a huge problem. Like we're talking about fertilizer and possible food shortages, and yet these countries are just wasting most of the nitrogen that they're using. Now, other countries like uh, Russia here, you see is a, is a nitrogen mining, which basically means that they have an overabundance of nitrogen in their soil. So they're not necessarily applying a lot of fertilizer, but the plants are just uh, absorbing them out of the, the nitrogen-rich soil in these areas. And so these countries are actually not adding fertilizer, but they're still using quite a bit of, uh, of nitrogen that's pre-existing in the soil. Same thing in Africa and in Argentina and some of these other countries. So these ones aren't so using a lot of fertilizers, but they have uh, nitrogen-rich soil. But that's kind of where the rub begins, right? Because we're talking about the geopolitical uh, conflict here between Russia and Ukraine. Most of the countries are banding together and actually putting boycotts or bans on Russian goods, and that includes fertilizer. So what happens when all this fertilizer, all this nitrogen rich fertilizer is now no longer available? That's probably like anywhere between 10 and 15 and maybe even up to 20 percent of the world's potash, and nitrogen and other uh, other common fertilizers come out of these countries. And so now that we're not using these, 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 these materials anymore for geopolitical reasons, it's going to create shortages in all these areas. And it becomes super, super, super important for us all to get as efficient as possible in our use of resources. Now, even if, even if and when we get through this crisis, I want you guys to understand that, you know, making your farm more efficient is just going to pay off in the long run anyway. It's not just for crisis situations like we have going on right now. I mean, making your farm more efficient and more cost, cost efficient as well is going to be dramatically important for you to not only get through this hard time we have right now or coming up, but also into the future so that we can all utilize uh, and eat healthier food with less petrochemical use. This, this is a worldwide problem. And again, even beyond the economic aspect of it, um, or food shortage aspect of it, we have environmental issues. We all hear about global warming and all these other things, but if we really handle this particular problem, we're gonna handle a lot of this. So uh, I wanted just to show you that because you know, I wanted to get a, 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 hopefully a better understanding of why we're having this issue and what we can sort of do about it. Now, now that I've shown you the problem, I kind of want to show you what the solution is or what our solution is. Because the Cuban Oxy Plant Booster is a technology that we've been promoting for the last couple of years. And it's already uh, proving itself to be a dramatic benefit in terms of fertilizer efficiency. In fact, many of our farms have been telling us that they're using quite a bit less fertilizer. They're getting much better quality crops and they're increasing their yield even with less fertilizer. And that's, of course, the name of the game. We want to increase yield. We want to reduce our costs. So from an economic standpoint, from an environmental standpoint, from a human health perspective, and to prevent catastrophic food shortages, the Kim and plant booster is a tremendous tool that we should all be using. And I wanted to let you guys know what this technology is and how it works, so that you can have a really firm grasp and understanding of why this is so important to get this out to as many farms as possible. So I will just say in preface to this, that if you're a farming operation and you haven't heard about the Kimonosic plant booster, or you've heard about it and haven't jumped on board yet, now is the time. The longer you wait, the more of a problem this nitrogen, uh, this nitrogen uh, fertilizer deficiency and, and shortages will become, and of course, that can lead to food shortages and a lot of other.
Nobody wants that. So let me show you what this Kimonosa line poster is so that you have a good grasp of why this is so important. So again, our mission as a company uh, in, in promoting this product is to help farmers grow healthier, better quality crops with lower costs and to achieve higher yields without harming the environment. That's our whole purpose. <coughs> that's why we got into this business. And that's why we continue to push to make it as many farms as possible. Um, <coughs> sorry, I had a question here. The installation, I'll get to the installation question in a minute here, uh, but uh, for now, I just want to uh, continue with this. So um, again, just to kind of walk you through what this is, this, this technology is biophysics applied to agriculture. So the reason why we can make plants so much more efficient is because we're not using chemistry. We're not using chemical means to stimulate plant growth. We're using physical means or physics to actually stimulate biological function of plants. So the whole idea of biophysics is based upon cellular function. And the fact that cellular function in all cells of a certain type are all ordered according to very specific uh, oscillations or frequency patterns. When a, plant, when a cell is healthy, it will have a nice orderly sine wave type of frequency output. Or if when a plant is unhealthy or, or in some ways damaged, its biophysical output will be distorted and create these distorted frequency patterns. Now, what happens in terms of a perspective of this? Like, imagine if you had a human heart with 100 million cells, right? And all those 100 million cells are all operating according to that same frequency, right? And they're all pumping at the same time, and they're all pumping, and the heart will function as, as it's designed to, because all the different cells within that heart are all pumping at the same time. However, when all 100 million cells start to operate at their own frequencies and various uh, disordered patterns that you see here, it's going to basically cause the heart to not function as a heart. You will end up dying very quickly. Now, in terms of organisms here, uh, with humans, fish, insects, they all have frequencies as well. In other words, the biological processes of every, any living thing can be measured according to frequency patterns. And when those biological processes are well aligned and well tuned, then the organism will be healthy and have a good metabolism and, of course, produce lots of energy. In case of plants here, what, uh, what, where this research originally came from was uh, Mr. Fulvio Baumelli at the Biomedic Center was a medical researcher. He'd been using this type of technique to analyze and discover ways of, uh, to improve human health and human function in various organs and biological systems. He'd been doing this for 30 years. Uh, he realized, though, that the common denominator of human illness and disease was actually poor nutrition. So he studied plant physiology for 20 years and came up with the human acid plant booster technology, which allows us to directly stimulate the biological functions of plants. He studied hundreds of varieties of plants and discovered that the photosynthesis process was pretty much the same across plant varieties. And when a plant is healthy, again, it will have a nice orderly way that, that stands, uh, that is normal and very easy to measure. When a plant is unhealthy or under stress, its biological functions will be distorted and First, that means the plant is going to disappear and die very quickly. <coughs> the Kimonasi plant booster as a product is actually an irrigation device. We have different types of devices for different types of irrigation systems. And we are working on a foliar application for non irrigating farmers. We should have that out by the end of this year. Uh, but in the meantime, any irrigating farmer is a, is a prime candidate for this. Uh, we can install this right on the existing pump or water source that you see on the left here. Or we can also plumb this right into any irrigation line for pump, pump diameters of uh, four inches or less. And that's usually for smaller farms or small trials. And the key benefits of our system is to improve photosynthesis efficiency in plant and improve soil health, including my microbial activity in the soil, electrical conductivity in the soil, and overall better uh, water retention characteristics. Now, I'm going to kind of skip over a lot of the results that we've seen through better photosynthesis. I want to kind of get to this point. Now, President Biden, just about a week ago, went on national television here in America and said that most America and other countries are going to have very real food shortages soon because, again, he's just planning. He's just looking at this going, we're not going to have enough fertilizer. They're not going to be able to grow enough, and we're not going to produce enough food. So prepare for food shortages, right? Now, of course, that's a doom and gloom way of saying it, but it's really kind of a defeatist attitude, like, oh, uh, there's this problem, let's just curl up in a ball and not do anything. Right? Of course, that's not what we're about here at Harvest Harmonics, and I know most farmers would not agree with that. They want to do something proactive about this, and of course, our system will do that. So our system will improve crop yields, plant health, plant nutrition, uh, 
produce quality and more while significantly reducing the need for fertilizers, agrochemicals, and water. This is, of course, going to not just benefit in terms of fertilizer usage, but it's also going to benefit in the reduction of pesticide and other usage. <clears throat> so taking a look at a few examples, um, you know, of, of this, uh, we've seen in corn trials here, this is a university trial we just wrapped up here. Uh, in the treated field, we use 50% less uh, water, 100% increase in overall corn yield, and of course, 100% reduction in fertilizer. In other words, they didn't even fertilize the Kimenasi field, yet uh, they, they basically doubled production in corn in, in this university trial. And this is going to white paper, which you have the results published here very shortly. In lentil production, we've seen, um, I'm not sure if you guys can see that because I have a little, let me see if I can take my uh, captain talk here because it looks like a trip lock in the way here, sorry. <clears throat> sorry about that. Okay, well, hi there, but there we go. Now we can see what the actual results are. Um, no, but here, this is a lentil production. This again is in India where we reduced uh, fertilizer usage here by 100% and still got a 33% increase in yield on lentils. Uh, this farmer didn't uh, didn't fertilize his grapevines and yet still got a six point increase in his uh, bricks rating on his grapes. Uh, this farmer got a 67% reduction in fertilizer use and still got a higher bricks rating for the quality of his plums. 50% uh, reduction in fertilizer use for flowers in Ecuador. This, uh, this grower has been continually buying more and more of our technology uh, every month and yet uh, he's using less and less fertilizer. Uh, reduction in fertilizer use and a 30% increase in eggplants in Washington. Again, uh, this farmer used less Washington. Um, now, one of the reasons why we're able to do this is because we're seeing a, an increase in CEC or cation ion exchange in the soil, as well as better organic matter. An example of this is we started off uh, here with the CEC rating of 18.3 across the control and the test fields here. And after the field was done, it's a little hard to see, but the uh, Kimenasi treated field increased its CEC to 21.9, while the other field, the control field, decreased it down to 13.3. So overall, there was a 65-point uh, change in CEC rating after this trial with the Kimenasi plant We've also seen reductions in water usage. Uh, and then some farmers are reporting using 45, 55, 65 percent less water uh, because of its better water retention characteristics in the soil. Uh, this farmer actually uh, was an almond farmer in Chile. He used 65% less water than the previous year with Kimenasi. Uh, we were reducing soil compaction, other factors that actually was creating huge issues. He was able to water for much less time. Now, this particular farmer had a water, um, you know, had a water hydrometer, so he could actually measure the moisture in the soil. He was noticing that they just they were getting to a much deeper water depth. And saturation point in much less time, which of course accounted for a much reduced water usage. This uh, walnut farmer uh, reduced his overall usage of water by 46 percent, uh, with a 30 percent increase in walnuts. And you can see here the trees are much much healthier. Uh, just by looking at the picture, you see how much healthier the trees are. Uh, here, this this grape farmer had 30 uh, percent less water available for irrigation than in previous years, and yet while all other plantations in the region decreased their production by 30 to 40 percent. Ours increased by 30 to 40 percent. Overall, it's a 75 percent swing there. Um, reduction in agrochemical use. Um, here we have a greenhouse where we didn't spray any insecticide or pesticide or fungicide. We treated greenhouse here. The first time in 17 years, the agronomist said he didn't have to spray. Uh, he also doubled his production in peppers. Imagine if you could reduce all of your pesticides and still double your production. And that's the kind of results we're seeing with human acid plant booster. 100% reduction in active chemical use. This is on a field trial in tomatoes. Again, huge differences there. Uh, huge reduction in the pest resistance, to, in, excuse me, pest uh, infestations there. Reduction of agrochemical use here on peppers with increased shelf life and vigor on peppers. Um, and again, with soil health, again, what we're seeing is better microbial activity in the soil, better electrical conductivity, and better water retention characteristics. And I wanted to just give you, and I'll show you that, but I wanted to show you this. <clears throat> this particular slide shows one of our uh, soil tests. Now here what we did is we reduced the, the electrical conductivity from 2.3, which was a higher range, down to 1.7, which was a medium or average range. And the sodium content from 1.1, which was toxic, uh, to a 0.6 concentration, which was, again, in range. Now what happens when the EC, or the electrical conductivity in soil, increases and sodium content especially increases. And this is a big problem with a lot of salty soils, a lot of arid climates, 
uh, like the Middle East, like North Africa, like uh, a lot of these sandy soils. When you have these situations in a high sodium content and a high EC content in the soil, what that does is causes the microbial activity to decrease in the soil. Those microbes start to go dormant. They stop doing what they're supposed to do. Now, microbes in the soil provide a number of beneficial functions to plant health. One of the things they're really good at is taking atmospheric nitrogen and converting it and fixing that nitrogen to usable forms by the plant. So that, will, that by itself will reduce your nitrogen fertilizer usage just in that sense. And they can also, of course, extend the rhizal with the rhizal fungi, they can extend the root structure out into the soil and allow the, the plants to contact water and nutrients much, much more efficiently. So when you can accomplish just those two or three factors in the soil itself, number one, the soil is going to rebuild and regenerate itself and be healthier. But number two, you're gonna find, again, you use less chemicals, you use less fertilizers, less, less inputs. And, and you can also get away because, because these types of things, by the way, are synergistic. So you improve the quality of the soil, you improve the plant, the plant will then feed the microbes in the soil with uh, certain exudates or excess energy that is produced during photosynthesis. And that whole microbiome will be improved. So we're not just talking about improving the situation here in the crisis, uh, the crisis time we're in here in 2022. Our system will actually increase and improve the overall situation going forward for a sustainable solution. So. Um, again, our system is an irrigation device. It utilizes a, a set of physical signals or radio wave signals as opposed to a chemical. So you're going to be able to use less fertilizer, improve the quality of your soil, improve the health of the plants, and improve the productivity all in one shot. So <clears throat> this really is sort of a one-shot solution. And the farmers that are using it are, are uh, having tremendous benefits this year. And of course, we want you to be using this too because there's no reason for people to go hungry. There's no reason for any food shortages. And there's definitely no reason to have fertilizer shortages when 40 to 60% of all the fertilizers being used around the world is being wasted and going right back to the environment anyway. Let's stop this madness, guys. Let's stop this. Let's, let's create a solution. Let's embrace a solution that's going to benefit everybody. It'll benefit the farmers. It'll make you more profitable. It'll create healthier food for everybody. It'll create less damage to the environment. And of course, it will prevent fertilizer and food shortages going forward in 2022. There's no reason for people to starve. Let's get efficient in our, in our farming operations and let's make your farm not only more sustainable, but more efficient than it's ever been. So you can put more money in your pocket and produce a better quality and more produce than you ever thought possible. Now, I did have a question here I'm gonna get back to. <clears throat> a couple ones here actually. Uh, one was uh, the installation of it as the technology installed in the main or secondary pipes. Uh, good question. Uh, you can install it right on the pump or right on the uh, water source itself, or you can install it at various points in, this, in the system. So if you wanted to do uh, your own little side-by-side -side comparison or install it further down the line, you of course could do that. Or if you want to treat your whole field and jump on board and really take advantage of the opportunity, you can install it on the pump and water all of your fields with one device. It's a, it's a pretty uh, unique system in the sense that we can put it anywhere in the irrigation line. Um, and that's pretty much all we got today, guys. I want to, again, just implore you guys, if you've seen this, uh, if you've kind of seen this technology, if you're interested in this, let's have a one-on-one -on -one consultation. We can do a cost-benefit analysis for you. Uh, you can actually uh, email me at service at harvestharmonics.com. We can set up an appointment for you to do a one-on-one -on -one consultation. Uh, I would like to get as many farmers uh, as possible on board with this technology this year. Uh, we're, right, we're right up on planting season right now. So let's get this installed. Let's get this going for you. And let's help become, your farm become part of the future of farming today so we can avoid fertilizer and food shortages going forward. Hope you hear from you guys soon.